Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read 1 to 15. We're going to be looking at 7 to 15. Uh, we're not going to complete this today, but this is called Gifts for Edification and Unity. Paul discusses unity, and then he discusses gifts for edification and unity. So this is very important and tangentially related to what we the preceding three sermons. <coughs> I'll begin reading at verse 1. I therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each of us, and here's the beginning of our text, but to each of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And we'll stop there even though it continues on the same topic. Thus far Paul has presented Christian virtues necessary for unity. The need or requirement to strive for Christian unity. That's the goal of every Christian or it should be the goal of every Christian. And the theological basis of Christian unity. Same thing with the doctrine of sanctification. Romans chapter 6 and other places. You need to live out what you already are in Christ. We need to live out that unity of being one in Christ. On this foundational teaching, now Paul now turns his attention to how God has determined that we should attain Christian unity. Paul wants to recognize its unity in Christ and to strive more and more to live consistent with this reality and thus preserve it, seek it, and improve it in daily life. Very similar to the doctrine of sanctification, and this, is, of course, is all related to the doctrine of sanctification. And after Paul talks about this, uh, the rest of chapter 4 is going to be dealing directly with sanctification. This brings Paul to Christ's victory his giving of spiritual gifts, and the need for progressive sanctification. For Paul, unity does not mean learning to compromise and tolerating ignorance and errors, but rather growing in edification. The teaching and ruling gifts are all given for the equipping of the saints so they can minister and edify the body of Christ, verse 12 till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, verse 13. Amazing goals, biblical goals, and we can't pragmatically say, well, that's just not attainable, so we're going to all compromise on doctrine and learn to live with each other's sins. That's just not the way it works, or that's not the way it's supposed to work. <clears throat> In the first few verses, he ties the attainment of edification and unity directly to Christ's salvation victory. In verses 7 to 10, we read, But to each one grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, He who ascended on high led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. Verse 7 introduces a new paragraph a new section that focuses on Christ giving different gifts to every Christian and Jesus' salvation victory that made this giving of gifts 
a reality. Remember Matthew 28. Now that Jesus has been raised from the dead, now that he's died on the cross and achieved a perfect victory, now he says, I've been given all authority on heaven and earth, therefore, go. Verse 7 has the meaning, to each single one of you. Okay, this is not restricted to gifts that are officers in the church. It's not restricted to that. To every single one of you, there has been given a grace according to the measure of Christ. There is not a single Christian, Paul says, without this gift of grace from Christ. So Paul is not simply discussing salvation in the narrow sense here. Forgiveness, justification. But gifts of the Spirit that, these, uh, that those saved receive for the sanctification of the whole body. While grace for gifts is given to every true Christian without exception, that grace or uh, charismata differs in form, amount, and aspect in every instance of its bestowment. And we are reminded of a few other passages. Uh, for example, Romans 12, 4 to 8. This is a very frequent topic for Paul. For we are, have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. <clears throat> so we being many, many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in, in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Here's what Hodge says. And you can see right away the great similarity between this passage and our passage. In these verses, we have the same comparison that occurs at length in 1 Corinthians 12 and for the same uh, purpose. The object of the apostle in both cases is the same. He designs to show the diversity of offices and gifts among Christians so far from being inconsistent with their union as one body in Christ is necessary to the perfection and usefulness of that body. It would be as unreasonable for all Christians to have the same gifts as for all members of the human frame to have the same office. This comparison is peculiar, beautiful, and appropriate because it not only clearly illustrates the particular point intended, but at the same time brings into view the important truth that the real union of Christians results from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As the union of the several members of the body is the result of their being all animated and actuated by one soul or spirit. <clears throat> Nothing can present in a clearer light the duty of Christian fellowship or the sinfulness of divisions and envyings among the members of Christ's body than the Apostles' comparison. Believers, though many, are one body in Christ and every member one of another. We, the many, are one body. In one respect we are many, in another we are one. Just as the body is many to its members and one in their organic connection, believers are one body that is a living organic whole not in the future of any external organization, but in Christ, that is in virtue of their common union with him. And as this union with Christ is not merely external or by profession, or by unity of opinion and sentiment only, but vital, arising from the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Christ, so the Apostle adds, the union of believers one with another is also a vital union. End of quote. That's excellent. It is crucial that we all recognize that we have received gifts of grace, every one of us, and thus we must endeavor to govern ourselves in such uh, a charismata and unity that we ha help our brothers in Christ to persevere and grow in the calling they have received. You see, mutual edification, mutual help. Christ has distributed his gifts in such a way so that we all act or are supposed to act as mutual edifiers or helpers to each other. Okay, so the church is not simply a lecture hall where you go to hear a sermon, sing a few psalms and go home. It's much more than that. We are bound to communicate together for each other's edification and goodwill. 
We must endeavor to use what God has given us for the profit and advancement of our brethren. We must allow ourselves to be helped and edified by our brethren. Okay, and you read the Proverbs and it talks about brothers walking together. And it talks about the need to receive correction in a humble way. And of course we read the, way, the, the proper way to give correction. And I speak the truth in love. Let your uh, communication be seasoned with salt. All these kind of passages. And then we see the several passages that which condemn gossip, which condemn slander, which condemn backbiting, which condemn speaking evil of another behind their back, even if it's true. You're to go to them for the purpose of edification, edification, not their destruction. And all of this takes Christian love and humility. Agreement and unity cannot occur without the humility which submits to the word of God and puts the other person first and is willing to set aside human traditions and corruptions. It takes humility to admit you're wrong. It takes humility for a church to say, look, this Christmas stuff, it's not in the Bible. We've got we to get rid of it. It takes humility to say, look, the Bible doesn't teach to use grape juice. We shouldn't be doing that. It takes humility to admit that Arminianism is a heresy and embrace the true gospel. It takes humility to communicate to people in error or in sin in a very loving, humble manner where you're trying to help them, not hurt them. And when we look at passages like this, we look at these sanctification passages in the New Testament, we see how bad the modern church really is. It's really quite bad, where gossip is rampant and so forth. The New Testament model of the Christian church is not simply <clears throat> one of hearing sermons each week, or one where the pastor and elders do everything while the people are passive. <clears throat> there is to be an essential body life where all work together for corporate sanctification. Now, I know how busy everybody is. I know how difficult that may be. But we don't water down what the Bible says we ought to be doing because we're all so busy. We need to make time. Essential unity is held in a great variety of spiritual gifts with the goal of all with the goal of edification. Egos are to be set aside for the sake of the body. <clears throat> I mean, the scripture is pretty clear. And disagreements should be able to get worked out. But what do people do? And I've seen this with presbyteries. Somebody can, you know, some people in the church confront the pastor about Christmas and some of these human traditions they're trying to put in, which are contrary to the Bible and our confession of faith and our, our uh, larger catechism and so forth, and our directory for worship. And what happens? They're threatened, they're gossiped about, they're slandered, and they're basically told to hit the road. That violates our passage. Here's what John Eady writes, the great Greek scholar. Differences of faculty or temperament, education or susceptibility are not superseded. Each gift in its own place completes the unity. What one devises another may plead for, while a third may act out the scheme. Or that sagacity, eloquence, and enterprise form a threefold cord not easily broken. <clears throat> it is so in the material creation. The little is, is as essential to symmetry as the great, the star as well as the sun, the raindrop equally with the ocean, the hyssop no less than the cedar. The pebble has its place as fittingly as the mountain, and colossal forms of life are surrounded by the tiny insect whose term of existence is limited to a summer's twilight. Why should the possession of this grace lead to self-inflation? It is simply Christ's gift to each one, and its amount and character as possessed by others ought surely to create no uneasiness nor jealousy. For it is of Christ's measurement as well as his bestowment, and every form and quantity of it, as it descends from the one source, is indispensable to the harmony of the church. No one is overlooked, and the one Lord will not bestow conflicting graces nor mar nor disturb by the repulsive antithope of his gifts. That unity, that preservation of which here and in this way is enjoined on all 
the members of his church. That's a great statement, end of quote. We are to be very humble, for we are indebted to Christ for everything. If somebody has a much greater gift than we, and there's always going to be people out there that are, have way greater gifts than we do, or I do, our attitude should be one of thankfulness. Thank you, Lord. We need people like George Gillespie in the church. We need people like Greg Bonson in the church. We need people like Cornelius Van Til and Gordon Clark in the church. We need people like John Calvin. But whatever we are, we should be thankful and humble. We are to be humble by submitting to the word of God and setting aside all human autonomy. It is pride and a form of humanism that sets aside the biblical definition of unity for ecumenicalism and loose, dishonest subscriptionism. And as we've noted before, and I should go into more, I should go into this more probably next week. <clears throat> whenever people get loose subscriptionism, and the the authority shifts from the the standards, the Westminster standards, to whatever the elders happen to think when they get together. Uh, generally, the people who are the most orthodox are the ones who suffer because they become the bad guys, because they become uh, regarded as disturbers of the peace of the church. Because they're seeking a pragmatic peace, an ecumenical false peace, they're not seeking true unity as defined by Scripture. In addition, Paul's teaching here speaks strongly against the modern notion of the church as an entertainment center geared toward fulfilling the desires of each person so they can feel self-fulfilled. I've done a lot of evangelism. I've locked, knocked on a lot of doors in my day. And the number one question, when I used to knock on doors, and I, I, I mean, there were times I did it 35, 40 hours a week, uh, tell me about your programs. It's, it's, you know, do you have a good rock group? Do you have a good uh, a worship leader? Do you have uh, good, good uh, fun things for the kids? That's not what the church is about. The church is about edification. It's not about entertainment. It's not about a, a humanistic version of self-fulfillment that comes from Norman Vincent Peale and psychology. It's not about that. It's about edification, growing in the knowledge of doctrine, growing in the knowledge of Christ, growing in sanctification, helping each other. The church is not patterned after Hollywood or a country club. It is not there to make us feel good about our, our uh, selfishness, our human autonomy, our heresy, and our lust for entertainment. These mega churches, you know, they're putting in tennis courts and all these things, and, you know, it's, I don't know, it's just ridiculous. The church is for edification, biblically defined. The gifts come from the glorified Christ, and they are designed for sanctification, the perfection of the body. If we sever the concepts of unity, edification, and sanctification from their biblical definitions, then everything connected to the concept of unity becomes humanistic and harmful. Unity becomes the reason for doctrinal disunity. And edification is twisted into toleration. And it always results in pragmatism. This is what drove me mad in the RP Church when I was in the RP church, uh, an issue, some matter would come up about doctrine or practice, usually corruption of worship, and how the presbytery, the, the presbytery I was in, how they would handle it was they would assign a commission, and they didn't look at things, well, what does the Bible have to say? Let's submit to the word of God. It was all pragmatism. What's going to offend the least amount of people? What's going to keep the status quo? They didn't think biblically at all. They thought pragmatically. And that's connected to a false concept of unity and ecumenicalism. The second thing in these verses that Paul wants us to focus on is the fact that all these gifts come to us through the glorified Christ. <clears throat> God, in saving and blessing us with gifts, did so in his plan of redemption, which involved the incarnation, our Lord's humiliation, his sacrificial death on the cross, his resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of God the Father. 
Paul paraphrases Psalm 68, 18 with an emphasis on Christ's victory over uh, our curse due to sin and his victory over the power of sin, which is slavery to sin and the second death. Jesus conquered Satan, sin, and death at the cross. Then he arose with all authority over heaven and earth. As the messianic savior king who sits at God's right hand, Jesus dispenses spiritual gifts and thus sanctifies and governs his kingdom of grace. It all comes from Christ. All heavenly blessings come to us through Jesus Christ. Everything. Everything. Jesus himself told the apostles to go to Jerusalem and wait for the pouring out of the Holy Spirit which would take place after his glorification. Now keep in mind the resurrection and the ascension and the sitting at the right hand of God are all organically connected in Scripture. By his death on the cross, Jesus achieved a perfect, complete, sufficient victory. This victory must be applied by the Holy Spirit progressively throughout history. So we speak of the definitive victory. He's already won the war, but it's got to be carried out progressively throughout history. You believe in Christ. You are truly a Christian. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You do possess eternal life. But then you've got that whole long life ahead of you where you've got to fight against sin and you've got to study your Bible and you've got to learn theology and you've got to put away anything that displeases God and replace it with godly counterparts. Everything comes to us from God through Christ. As Paul says in Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. Our seeking the edification and unity of the body of Christ flows from God's gift of salvation and Christ's gift of the Holy Spirit with particular gifts to every Christian. Very simple doctrine, very critical doctrine. Our response can only be the praise of God as determined by his word, and a grateful life of obedience to his word. Here's what Calvin says. <clears throat> For if a man asks us why his goodness feeds and, cherish and, nourish it and uh, nourishes us, and finally why he, as it were, dazzles us with a great number of benefits he bestows upon us, it is in order that we should yield some acknowledgement of them to him. You see then that all we can ever bring to God is but to acknowledge ourselves bound to him for all things. How can you not live for Christ once you understand what he's done for you? We are to serve the Lord directly through worship, only as he, as he has commanded in his word, obviously, and by obedience to everything he requires of us. And this includes using our gifts for the edification of the body of Christ with the goal of unity. Paul explains this quote of Psalm 68, 18 in verses 9 and 10. This psalm refers to Christ and his work of redemption. Jesus had to suffer vicariously, that is, in the place of his people on the cross. He had to die. He had to be buried to redeem us by paying for our sins in full, defeating Satan, conquering death for the elect throughout the world. Before he could be exalted to God's right hand, he achieved a total victory. The amazing descriptions of the worldwide blessings that come as a result of the coming of the Messiah refer both to the definitive and progressive victory between the first and second coming, as well as the final and complete victory in history at the second coming. The prediction that every knee shall bow to Christ and every tongue confess to him is a prediction not only of the eventual prevalence of the true Christian religion throughout the world, okay, we're post-millennialists, but also of that which takes place at the final and general judgment following the second coming of Christ. So you have Two choices. People are either going to bow in love and honor and reverence toward the King of Kings. Oh Lord, we thank you so much. We're filthy, rotten sinners. We were standing above the precipice of hell, right? We, we deserve to go to hell. We were condemned and you saved us. 
or they're going to bow in terror and dread at the final judgment, right before they're cast in the lake of fire. It's, uh, I would say, the first option is the one you want. You want to believe in Christ. And then third, Paul mentioned some of the gifts that Jesus gives the church in verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, there are different lists of gifts in the New Testament, all of which are similar. In Romans 12, 6 to 8, we find seven gifts noted. Number one, prophecy. Number two, ministry. Number three, teaching. Four, exhortation. Five, giving. Six, leading. Seven, showing mercy. Now, these are not exclusive of each other. Obviously, somebody who teaches exhorts and ministers. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, we find eight noted. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, the gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. And then verse 30 indicates that there's also the gift of interpreting the tongues or translating the tongues. Remember, in the New Testament, in the apostolic period, tongues were actual real languages. And people couldn't benefit, and they were prophetic. They contained divine revelation. People could not benefit from that unless somebody interpreted it. That is, translated it, told you what it meant. So it has nothing in common with modern charismatic tongues where people are, you know, going yabba dabba do and gibbering like, like they're on LSD. Regarding the gifts, there are a number of things to note. In some lists, there's an order of rank given. And this is certainly true of 1 Corinthians 12 in our text. Follows this order. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. The highest office in the church is apostle, followed by uh, ev a prophet evangelists, then pastor, teachers. In addition, there are ordinary gifts that continue throughout the whole New Covenant era, such as pastor, teacher, and ruler or elder or administrator or governor. Uh, the way, we, way it's commonly put today is there are teaching elders and ruling elders in the church. All ruling elders ought to be able, able to teach, but not all ruling elders do a lot of teaching. That's The pastor does most of the teaching. <clears throat> There's deacons who have uh, minist uh, ministries of mercy. There are temporary gifts that cease with the end of the apostolic period when... The foundation of the church was being laid, such as apostle, evangelist, the word of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, the interpretation of tongues and miracles. Anything relating, and we'll go into this, I'm not going to go into a lot, but anything relating to direct revelation or sign gifts ceased after the completion of the canon and the death of the, the apostles. Paul says in Corinthians, when the perfect comes, you know, we see, like, in a mirror that's obscured. But when the perfect comes, he says, prophecy in the word of knowledge will cease. It will cease. The charismatic movement strongly disagrees, but we can reject the charismatic movement for the following reasons. A, the charismatic movement, and I, I, I've studied the history of the charismatic movement in, in depth, it begins in the late 1800s, really gets going around night, the beginning of the 20th century with the Azusa Street Revival. The charismatic movement has always been either Pelagian or semi-Pelagian slash Arminian in their doctrine of salvation. People who deny the gospel of sovereign grace are not bringing us a revival. But the opposite, corruption and heresy. Okay, you know them by their fruits, you know them uh, if somebody claims they're bringing you a revival and they're teaching a false doctrine of salvation, you know they're wrong. In addition, many of the original Pentecostals were Unitarians. The Azusa Street Revival and those first guys, they were all Unitarians. And we even have the United Pentecostal Church today where we're still Unitarians. They're modalists. They believe that there's one God who is, is like steam, water, and ice. Sometimes he appears as a son. Sometimes he comes as the Holy Spirit. But sometimes he's God. That's not the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. 
there are three persons of the Trinity. There's one God, three persons. There are interpersonal distinctions of the Godhead. Uh, the Son talks to the Father. The Father talks to the Son. The Fa Son and the Father talk to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit communicates with the Father and the Son. Uh, if, if they're just simply modes, that would not make any sense whatsoever. <clears throat> B. The roots of the charismatic movement is, is the heretical teaching of, of Wesley, where sanctification is regarded as a separate, secondary work of grace, where believers are zapped, and then they obey. It's also connected to perfectionism. It's very different than the biblical doctrine of sanctification. Wesleyanism is a very false doctrine of sanctification. And you, you, if you're part of the charismatic church, and they have the altar calls, and the altar call will first have an appeal, come up and receive Christ as your Savior. Then they'll say, come up and rededicate your life to Christ, and we'll lay hands on you, and you'll get slain in the Spirit, you'll get zapped. Instead of the biblical doctrine of sanctification, where you need to pray and study the Word of God and attend all the means of grace diligently and work to grow in holiness over time, uh, they think of it more of as a zapping of the Holy Spirit. Let go and let God kind of a thing. <clears throat> all of which, is, of course, is heresy. C. There is no charismatic in the whole world that really practices the supernatural gifts. There are no charismatics in the whole world that really practices the supernatural gifts. No, there's none. There are no real healers today. There are no real, you know, Paul and, and Peter and Christ of, and, and, and these people who did miracles in the New Testament, they didn't do them in church services. They did them in public. And they were, you know, things where an arm would grow on or somebody would rise from the dead. They were not, oh, oh, my foot was a little bit shorter than this foot. Now my foot's a little longer. Or the guy calls out, oh, there's somebody on the balcony. His hemorrhoids have been healed. There, there are things that were authenticating the message. They, they were absolute proof of divine intervention in history. We don't see that today. And if we did, it would be on the news. If there was a guy out there actually raising the dead and actually healing people, believe me, you'd know about it. It's not happening. Benny Hinn and all those guys are total frauds. Tongues, which were real languages in the, in the apostolic period, uh, what's happening today is nothing but babbling gibberish. And several studies have been done where tongues were taped. It doesn't have a structure. It doesn't have a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Uh, it doesn't have prepositions. It's gibberish. Yabba dabba scuba dabba diddly doo ba doo. Yabba dabba scoodly doo ba. It's not, it's not a real language. It's gibberish. Prophecy, of course, is easily uh, provable if it's real prophecy. It has to be accurate. Something that's predicted always has to come to pass with 100% proof. Charismatic, keep in mind, I was a charismatic for years. I know all about it. The charismatic prophecy is either super vague, so it can't be proof true or false. Oh, come to me, my people, and I will bless you. Oh, be blessed. It's either that, or when they do get specific, like the guy in the 700 Club has a few times, they're always wrong. They're always wrong. Whenever they get specific, they're always proof false. The same goes for divine healings. Charismatic healers are liars, frauds, and shysters. We never, ever see verifiable, real, obvious miracles like we find in the Gospels in the book of Acts. Uh, people tried to prove the miracles of Catherine Coleman. They tried to prove the miracles of Kenneth Hagin. They tried to prove the miracles of Oral Roberts. And you know what they found? They couldn't find one verifiable miracle. Not one. Not one. Where you look at the healings of Jesus and the apostles and the evangelists in the book of Acts, even the enemies of Christ couldn't deny the miracles. What they tried to do is attribute it to the power of Satan, not God. But they couldn't deny that a miracle had taken place. This guy was born blind. Now he sees. What are we going to do about it? This guy from birth couldn't walk. And now he's leaping and praising God. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to cover this up? Further, there are gifts that are also offices in the church which require ordination. And there are gifts that are obviously not offices. The vast majority of gifts are not offices. And let us briefly note the offices mentioned by Paul. We'll just look at it really very uh, briefly. But you, you, know, you get to know people and you see certain people have different gifts. Some are intellectual. 
some are in mercy, some are in getting people together. There are all sorts of gifts. And the church has to take more of an active role in helping people see what their gifts are and developing those gifts and putting them to use. The first, of course, is apostle, which is the highest ranking officer. Now, to be an apostle, wanted to be trained personally by Jesus Christ, Acts 1, 15, 26. You had to be trained by Christ. So that means there are no apostles after the death of the apostles. One had to have, <coughs> excuse me, physically seen the resurrected Christ. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, says, I was the last person to see Jesus alive. Paul is the last person to see the resurrected Christ. So after Paul, there are no more apostles. So when you, you know, I remember I was a Pentecostal. I went up, I was a, a hippie. And I went, uh, I drove up to Eureka. There was a, a Christian commune up there. And they had the guy that they called the apostle. Everything he said, they tape recorded and wrote it down. And he was just a total, you know, I look back at the stuff he was saying. He was a nut. But they called him the apostle. No. Did he see the risen Christ? No. Was he trained personally by Christ? No. There were 12 apostles, then uh, 11 with, uh, after Judas' apostasy and suicide. Then Matt, uh, Matthias was chosen by lot to make the number 12 again. They had to have the number 12. It was a, a, a whole, a significant number. The number 12 is symbolic and was probably chosen by Jesus because the 12 apostles are the beginning of the New Covenant Church, as the 12 patriarchs were the beginning of the nation of Israel. The symbolic representation of the church in Revelation as the holy city, the New Jerusalem, has the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the gates. Remember, there are 12 gates to the city. It's a perfect cube, four sides. And it's not meant to be taken literally. The, the walls would be 1,200 miles long and 1,200 miles high. I don't think that's to be taken literally. But it had 12 gates with the names of the uh, patriarchs on it. And then the foundation has the names of the 12 apostles. And this agrees with Ephesians 2.20 where we are told that the church of Christ is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's New Testament prophets. They gave us revelation. We have the book of Luke. We have the gospel of Matthew. We have the book of Acts. They are foundational because they possess revelatory gifts. The apostles had the specific job of interpreting the work of Christ, the person and work of Christ in an inspired, infallible manner to be inscripturated in the New Testament for all future generations. The preaching and writing of the apostles and their close companions, the evangelists, who had special revelatory gifts, provides the world the basic, inerrant historical record as well as the inspired, infallible interpretation of that redemptive history. This is the only way that all future generations can know the truth about God, Christ, salvation, and theology. That is everything we need to know about faith and life. So when these atheist idiots say, well, we can't uh, know anything about Christ because we have to find stuff in the secular record. That's complete foolishness. We have an infallible record in the word of God. Everything we need to know is there. And if you don't know it, you better get studying. This is the only time a replacement was chosen, and this occurred before the ascension. Clearly, Jesus did intend for the office to continue throughout, did not intend for the office to continue throughout history. Paul was an apostle, which he says, I, he says, I was chosen out of due time. And although technically not one of the tw original twelve, he was certainly an apostle. He was an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ, Acts 26, 16 to 18, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, and 15, 8. And he was trained personally by Jesus Christ for over three years in the wilderness. So he was called out of due time, but the things necessary to be an apostle, Christ provided for him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7 to 8, Paul says he was the last living person to see the risen Lord. Besides their spiritual gift of inspiration and revelatory gifts, they also possessed authoritative sign gifts. <clears throat> and we see this in redemptive history. When God is giving forth new revelation, something really new and important is happening in redemptive history, it's authenticated with signs and miracles. 
Historic Protestantism teaches that the sign gift serves a distinct purpose of the apostolic church, that of authenticating the apostles' teaching. Once the Spirit-inspired teachings concerning the person and work of Christ were inscripturated, the New Testament canon was completed, the, what is it, 27 books of the New Testament, revelation ceased. Because signs were no longer needed to authenticate. Okay, sign, signs are, <laughs> miracles were not given so we could have healing services and everybody could go, wow, this is great, man, this is cool. No, they weren't given for that. They were given to authenticate the gospel. The new revelation, the revelation of the mystery about Christ. Now, to determine if the sign gifts are still normative, we must answer three questions. What was the purpose of the sign gifts? Did the sign gifts cease at the, after the completion of the New Testament? Are the miracles that are supposedly occurring today the same as those occurred in the days of Christ and the Apostle? The Bible teaches that the signs are public, visible, miraculous events, and the purpose was not to give believers exciting worship services or a wonderful experience, but to authenticate a divine message or messenger to prove publicly that the person performing the miracles was sent from God. In Exodus 4-5, God told Moses to perform miracles in order, and here's what it says, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, has appeared to you. Moses, uh, God talks to Moses. He says, you're going to go to Israel, you're going to help deliver, I'm going to have you be, use you to get them out of Egypt. You're going to be my man in this operation. And Moses says, who's going to believe me? I'm out here, you know, shepherding the sheep out in the middle of nowhere. I haven't even been there in a long time. Why are they going to believe me? And God says, I'm going to, and God gives him, he has a staff and God's going to, you know, he's going to do mighty miracles. That's going to prove, that's going to be proof the miracles attested Moses' divine mission. Elijah was sent to reside with a widow in uh, Zarephath, 1 Kings 17. After the widow's son died, Elijah prayed to God, and God revived her son. Now, what did the widow say? And this is in the Bible for our benefit. And did I write it down? Yeah. Uh, 1 Kings 17, 14, uh, 24. Now, by this miracle... I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. She interpreted the miracle correctly. The purpose of miracles is not, wow, you're a groovy guy. Let me give you $25 million so you can buy a new jet and get another mansion. That's not the purpose of miracles. When Jesus was asked at the feet of dedication, if he was the Christ, he said, and this is from John 10, 25, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. You may not like my message. You may not believe in me. But the miracles I'm doing among, in your midst prove that I am the Messiah. You have absolute proof. Nicodemus told Christ, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one, this is John 3, 2, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And then the man born blind chided the Pharisees for not knowing that Jesus was sent from God. You do not know where he is from, and yet he has opened my eyes? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. John 9, 30 and 33. The signs that Jesus did authenticated both him and his message. His greatest sign, of course, was the resurrection. you got to get away from this. Uh, form of apologetic that's based on humanism. This this uh, this thing that we have to we have to have evidences outside of the Bible. We have to have we have to prove we have to have some kind of secular atheistic proof before we can go to the Bible. No, no, get rid of that. That's stupid thinking. We do have proof. We have the resurrected Christ. We have the Word of God. And if you don't have the Word of God, you can't uh, prove anything. In history, let alone the Bible. You know, it's the impossibility of the contrary uh, as far as paganism goes. The Apostle tells the Corinthians that the miracle he performed, the miracles he performed, proved his apostolic authority. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 12 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Now, if miracles were a normal thing that everybody could do, or were common, 
Such a statement would have proved nothing. Miracles were never an end in themselves, but they authenticated the apostolic marriage and the, uh, message in the first century. And when Paul and Barnabas preached, the Lord was bearing witness, this is Acts 14.3, to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And the author of Hebrews asked this question. How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Hebrews 2, 3 to 4. And the passage refers to the apostles. So we can have total confidence in the word of God. We can have total confidence in the gospel. We can have total confidence in the work of Christ. So don't listen to these atheistic apologists. If you take what the atheistic apologists say, and you don't stand on the word of God, you can't prove anything. You can't prove anything in history. Now the New Testament canon is closed and the apostles are dead, the sign gifts have ceased. For they serve their purpose. And we noted that the miracles were not done in revival meetings. They were done out in the open. B.B. Warfield, who did an extensive historical study of miracles, concluded that miracles did in fact cease after the death of the apostles. He noted that as heresy and superstition ceased, increased in the papal church, so did the amount of miracles. These miracles were obviously fraudulent, because they are associated with gross heresy, idolatry, and superstition. You know, miracles, uh, oh, I was healed because I was sprinkled with Mary's breast milk. Or I touched the skull of John the Baptist. I'm, I'm serious. And, you, and, and Roman Catholics are still into all this superstition, satanic superstition nonsense. Oh, I, I looked at the statue of Mary, the Blessed Virgin, and she was crying tears, and I touched the blood, and I rubbed it on my scalp, my scalp, and my dandruff disappeared forever. It's, it's superstition. And poor David Chilton, who became a full preterist and then completely apostatized by joining the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, he had a severe heart attack. I think he had a couple of heart attacks, and he said he was healed. They put a piece of the cross on my chest. They put a piece of the cross on my chest, and it healed me. Of course, he died soon after. It's a sad thing. A great, a, a great writer, a very intelligent guy, but he apostatized. The Greek Orthodox, Hank Hanegraaff is apostatized. The Greek Orthodox Church explicitly denies the biblical doctrine of salvation. They explicitly deny justification by faith alone. The Reformation, with its solid biblical theology, discarded all such nonsense and pointed people back to the pure, infallible, sufficient Word of God, sola scriptura. <clears throat> and sadly, the charismatic movement, which is extremely popular throughout the world, is turning away from the purity of the Reformation doctrine back toward the subjectivism, the existentialism, the mysticism, and the superstitions of Rome. The charismatic movement is a shift toward Rome, not a revival. This whole idea, accept Jesus into your heart. That's not the gospel. The gospel is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in what he did. Then the spirit of Christ will be in your heart. But it's not, hey, Jesus, uh, I'm sovereign here. I got a free will. Will you come and live in my heart? But anyway, it's another topic. The second gift is that of evangelists. These were the close associates of the apostles. You got John Mark. You got Timothy. You got Luke. John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Luke wrote the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke and Acts. These men had special gifts of inspiration and also had sign gifts. We think, for example, of Philip. People use the word evangelist today to speak generally of missionaries and people who preach the gospel. And in a, in a sense, that's true, but that's not the same as the original office. The original office ceased. We don't have people today who have sign gifts who are receiving direct revelation. And generally, they were the close associates and helpers of the apostles. And they wrote scripture. The third is that of prophets. These are New Testament prophets. 
Paul always places them after apostle. If he was discussing Old Testament prophets, he would be, they would be mentioned before apostles, not after. These are New Testament apostles, uh, prophets. The New Testament prophet possesses the same gift as the Old Testament prophet. There is no such thing, contrary to the charismatic movement, contrary to the Steelites, there is no such thing as a lesser form of prophecy. If you study the word prophet, get a concordance out, study the Greek, study the Hebrew, study the text, prophets are prophets. There's no lesser form of prophecy. There's one form of prophecy. The true prophet speaks the very word of God. Whatever the Lord has commanded him to speak, the prophet presumes to speak a word in mind. This is from uh, Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. It, it defines what a prophet is in the both testaments. <coughs> the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if he does not happen or come to, if, if it doesn't happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, shall, you shall not be afraid of him. So how do you know that if somebody's a true prophet? Well, first the prophet must speak in the name of the true God. The prophet must have correct theology. Do charismatics have correct theology? No, they're Arminians, they're semi-Pelagians. They believe all sorts of heresies. So, don't listen to them. Don't give them any heed at all. Benny Hinn and all these guys are Oral Roberts, a bunch of false prophets. There's an excellent book by John Robbins uh, about Pat Robertson where he actually watched thousand, probably watched a thousand hours of television programming and he wrote down every prophecy that, that uh, Pat Robertson said over the years. Every single one of them failed to come to pass. <laughs> Every single one of them. And then second, whatever the prophet prophesies must come to pass with 100% accuracy. Anything less demanded death by stoning. So, if somebody claims they have the gift of prophecy and yet never gives a specific prophecy by which a prophet can be objectively tested, we have absolutely no reason to believe or fear that so-called so prophet. What gave the prophets unique authority? An objective validation, even to unbelievers, was the fact that whatever they said came to pass. You know, and you look at Elijah, when he, 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 he predicted, he gave a prophecy. Ahab would be slain, and uh, the dogs would lick up his blood. Or was it Jezebel? Jezebel would be slain, the dogs would lick up the blood. It happened perfectly. And then after it happened, the text in the scriptures says, now, you know, this is the proof that this guy was a real prophet. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the church, Peter quoted the, the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. So the New Testament prophet was involved in the exact same phenomena associated with Old Testament prophet. Dreams, visions, prophecy. Numbers 12.6. We have an Old Testament prophecy type uh, with Old Testament prophetic modes described entering into the New Covenant era and in fulfillment of a specific Old Testament prophet's word. So, Agabus, New Testament prophet, same thing. And here are a couple words associated with this. In the New Testament, prophet actually speaks direct work from God's and is not merely a teacher or preacher, is supported by Paul. 1 Corinthians 13, 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. The word mystery in the New Testament does not mean the same thing as our English word. In the New Testament, the word occurs 27 or 28 times, chiefly in Paul, and it bears its ancient sense of a revealed secret, not its modern sense of that which cannot be fathomed or comprehended. By far the most common meaning in the New Testament is that which is so characteristic of Paul, a divine truth once hidden, but now revealed in the gospel. It should bear noting how closely mystery is associated with revelation, as well as other words of similar import. Mystery and revelation are in fact correlative and almost synonymous terms. The prophet reveals to the church a mystery or mysteries by divine revelation from God. 
So he reveals something previously unknown. The word revelation, apocalypsis, is a disclosure of something that was before unknown, and divine revelation is the direct communication of truths before unknown. Uh, they come from God to men. The disclosure may be dreams, visions, oral communication, or otherwise. I gave several examples. And the fact the New Testament prophet office is revelatory like the Old Testament office is clearly taught by Paul's use of mystery and revelation. He puts both terms together in Ephesians 3, 3 to 5. By revelation he made known to me the mystery. As I wrote before in a few words by which you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, and has is, is now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. <clears throat> so, is the gift of prophecy, is there a lesser form of prophecy in the New Covenant era? No, there is not. And that's what our Westminster Standards teach. They spoke under divine inspiration. They spoke mysteries. The Holy Spirit revealed to the church that the ceremonial laws of the Old Covenant were put away. The middle wall of partition has been broken down. And many other things. God only has one people. The gift of prophecy also ceased with the close of the canon. The church, Paul says, was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The foundation is the word of God. The foundation once laid is not laid again. One foundation. And then the fourth gift is pastor-teacher. Now, churchmen are divided over whether or not these words describe two separate offices or the function of one office. And I could have given, I didn't do it, but there's a huge list of people who believe one way, and there's a, with great people in it, like John Calvin, and even the directory for, uh, of government in the Westminster Standards. And then there's another huge list of really prominent people who believe the other way. The Greek indicates that there are, this is one office for the recurring tus de and some is omitted before didaskalos, teacher. Pastor and teacher are only separated by chi or the word and. <coughs> so grammatically, if we follow the Greek grammar, which is what we're supposed to do when we exegete scripture, there's one office. Pastor slash teacher. Pastor slash teacher. In addition, we do not find a separate office of doctor or teacher of separate from the pastor in the New Testament scriptures. There are no examples of a doctor in the New Testament. Not one. You have teachers who are elders. They're teaching elders. If a church has pastors with exceptional intellectual gifts and they want to encourage them to write and do scholarship in addition to their pastoral duties, that is wise, good, and fine. The Episcopal Church used to do that. You know, they take somebody like a J.C. Rowell kind of person, they go, no, hey, this guy's really gifted, this guy's really got a special intellect. Let's encourage him to write more. Let's encourage him to do more. And then they might bring in a guy to help with the preaching or so forth. <clears throat> you, know, and, you know, if the church wants to do that, it's good, that's fine, I think it's wise. But they are not a separate distinct office. They're not. They're not. We must follow the Greek grammar and the biblical evidence and not follow a church tradition. Presbyterians have tended to follow Calvin, who advocated a separate office, but the exegetical evidence for this is exceptionally weak, if not non-existent. And I think this is an area where the Westminster Standards ought to be amended or changed. We can have teachers in the church, we can have doctors in the church, but they're, they're just pastors that have exceptional gifts, and we help them. Uh, if you've got a Greg Bonson in the church, if you've got a George Gillespie, if you've got a Rutherford, help them do more in different areas. That's all, but they're not a separate office. <clears throat> the word pastor comes from uh, tending sheep and goats, and it carries the idea of feeding and caring, caring for. It implies instruction and doctrine as well as careful, tender, vigilant supervision and government. Pastor teachers preach, teach, exhort, give personal counseling, and even discipline along with the elders when necessary as a member of the session. For this reason, pastor teachers are also called elders or overseers. So the two primary things a pastor ought to be doing, teaching and counseling. Those are the two main things, and they're both ministries of the word. 
you know, things like praying and all that, that that's just a given. But the, the two main functions, preaching, teaching, counseling. You know, uh, some pastors, I've done a ton of counseling. You know, nobody sees that, nobody knows about it because it's not to be talked about. But counseling is very critical. The office is placed after the revelatory gifts for expositing the word of God is not the same as giving forth new inspired revelations. The office of pastor teacher continues through the whole new covenant era. Teaching is the main characteristic of this office. A Christian overseer or pastor must be able to teach, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 2. In Titus, it is said that in virtue of his office, he must be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. He's got to know what he's doing. He's got to know doctrine. He's got to be able to refute the federal visionist. He's got to be able to refute Arminianism and Roman Catholicism. He's got to refute the sacramentalist heretics. There is government and instruction and doctrine and government is subordinate to, dependent upon, and governed by doctrine. Okay, basically all counseling is applying scriptures to a specific situation in the life of your people. Discipline is applying scripture specifically to something that somebody is doing or teaching that is wrong. The anti-doctrinal, anti-precision, and anti-carefulness that characterizes the modern age in most professing Christian circles today is very strange and unseemly, given the description of the pastoral office in the New Testament. And then this is where we're going to stop today. I'll just introduce what we're going to do next week. Fourth. This will be, have to wait, Lord willing, for next week. Paul tells us the reason why these gifts are given in verses 12 to 16. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. Till we all come to the unity of, of the faith and the acknowledgement of the Son of, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the structure of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be tossed, be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And I'll stop there. It goes on speaking the truth in love and all these things. Just note two things really quickly, just to whet your appetite for next week, Lord willing. These offices were established by Christ for protecting the saints, so that the saints, along with the pastors and elders, could serve and build up the whole church in the present generation and pass on that progress to future generations. So a pastor and the elders are more like a coach on a football team than uh, a performer up on stage with people sitting in, 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 in seats watching them. <laughs> and then, oh, that was really neat. See you later. I remember the first time I went to plant a church in 1995, I only had one family. It's really a dumb idea uh, but it got approved and uh, the family basically said to me well have fun <laughs> have fun you know hope you do good they you know we're not going to help you at all but go you know give it a shot <laughs> it is crucial to note that the edifying and unifying work is not limited to church officers People who are not church officers are obligated to work for perfection in doctrine, worship, government, ethics, and not simply to go along with declension and human traditions, heirs, and loose subscriptionism for the sake of, of a false peace. People generally don't know this or believe this today. I was amazed when the Federal Vision broke out in 2002, and they deny justification by faith alone. They believe that faith and works are basically the same thing, and that you're saved by your faith and your faithful obedience, which is very similar to Roman Catholicism. 99.9% .9 of the church members in the churches where the pastors adopted this heresy went along with it. They went along with it. That means the covenant heads, those fathers, did not know doctrine in a sophisticated way. They did not know enough about doctrine to be able to say, wait a minute, this doesn't agree with Scripture. This doesn't agree with Paul. This doesn't agree with Jesus. This doesn't agree with our Westminster standards. We need to discipline this pastor and, and throw him out of the church and get another pastor. No, they went right along with it. 
Doug Wilson, who has a humongous church, I think he lost two or three families at the most. Same with the church down there in, in uh, uh, what was that, Louisiana. I think it was Louisiana. They only lost a few families. People went right along with the heresy. They went right along with it. Now, part of that is the sophistication of the heretic. You're very sophisticated and very, uh, as we read that passage earlier, using trickery and deceit to trick people into false doctrine. But you are responsible to know the truth. You are responsible to help perfect the body of Christ. A person, now I don't know what he's been doing. I haven't talk, talked to him in many, many years. But a person who I always look up to as somebody who was doing this was uh, Kevin Reed. And he, that was the book we were reading last week that he published on John Knox. He was not an elder. I don't think he was. He certainly wasn't a minister. And yet he was fighting against the errors that were occurring in the OPC and the PCA by publishing excellent stuff by Calvin and Knox and these kind of people that were against what was happening. And he would write little things himself. There are things you can do. I think that if your pastor celebrating Christmas and you're a Presbyterian, you should bring him up on charges. If the, if the session tells you to jump on a lake, go to Presbytery. If the Presbytery tells you to jump on a lake, go to the Synod or the General Assembly. Fight it all the way to the top. Make them throw you out of the church. Now, it'll not be just. Christ won't recognize it. But you've done your duty. This, this thing, well, we live in a corrupt age. Things are corrupt. That's the way they are. We've got to be pragmatic. We've got to tolerate things as they are and just accept it. And if you fight against it, you're just rocking the boat and you're disturbing the peace of the church and you're, you're the one who's wrong. That whole attitude is unscriptural. It contradicts our passage. It contradicts all the passages we looked at last week or the week before that talked about the duty to fight against error and heresy. So keep that in mind. And then two, we see that preaching the gospel and the whole counsel of God has the aim of genuine unity and theological and practical agreement. Loose subscriptionism denies this, and it implies that genuine unity is simply impossible, so we need to learn to compromise on doctrine, we need to compromise on worship, we need to compromise on discipline, we need to compromise on practice, we need to compromise on the sacraments. And this, we have noted, was not the position of the Puritans of the original Presbyterians. It's certainly not the position of Paul or Jesus or Peter, or the, or the Bible. Now, I know we live in a time of declension. I know it's hard. It, it's very easy to say, hey, look, you know, this church has all kinds of corruptions, but, you know, we got to go somewhere. Let's just go there and hold our nose and just take it. No, you're to work for reformation. You're to work for the unity of the church. You're to you work for the edification of the body. If people don't, you know, but you have to do it, as we, we're going to look at, speaking the truth in love, being gentle and humble and do it, do it right, do it properly. But you have to do it. Are people going to hate you? Are people going to lie about you? Are people going to gossip about you? Are people going to be mean to you? Absolutely. But it's your duty. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this passage and others like it. It's just so humbling. We are so far from what we need to be doing, Lord. We, we confess that we fall short on these things. Help us, Lord, to be very knowledgeable, but to be very humble and to seek the true unity of the church in your way, as you've commanded us in Scripture. Help us. For people don't want to hear it. People don't want to hear the truth today. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.